Good morning. Sorry to be a minute or two late here. This is Doc from Fossil Creek Nursery. And we're going to talk today about grasses. Now, part of understanding grasses is to understand the first thing about fundamental groupings. Not all grass is viable for turf grass. Not all grass is viable for ornamental grass. And certainly not all grass is viable for pasture grass. Part of what we're going to talk about today briefly is the difference between them. And then we're going to focus on ornamental grasses of all sorts. Those that are native and those that are imports. Turf grasses like poa, bluegrass, or fescues and rye are mixed here in Colorado to make athletic fields, parks, lawns, and the like. That's a subject for another day. Pasture grasses are typically native grasses to the plains. They don't have to be all to the plains of northern uh, and eastern high dry steppe of Colorado uh, next to the foothills, but they are intended for the quality of nutrition, the hardiness, uh, the ability to spread a little bit, so uh, there are not a whole lot of bare spots in a, in a pasture. But now let's talk about ornamental grasses, and there are many. In the United States, we have a few belts, uh, areas, uh, the eastern Midwest, Indiana, maybe Western Ohio, Illinois, even into Iowa, where the tall grasses, tall grasses like um, big blue stem or um, switch grass are native and common. And they like that area, they've grown in that area because of the quality of the soils and the moisture in the soil. There, there's 25 to maybe 30 inches of natural rainfall. And as a result, the organic matter is better decomposed because better things grew there over time. More things grew. And there is deep moisture in the soil. Deep down, the moisture resides as well as near the surface. So as a result, these can be strong and hardy because the taller the grass in general, the more water it needs every day or over time, the more access to water and generally wants to stay in moist soils. So then that's called the corn belt. It's not technical, but the common terminology for that area. Then we get to the wheat belt. That's more Nebraska, Kansas, and far northeastern Colorado, where it is uh, often more moist because the bigger storms come there along the North Platte and Sterling and those areas. And you get a mixture of the different grasses. So that would be tall grasses as well as short grasses. And in nature, there's short grass prairie, which presides predominantly Denver and South and Colorado, and in some cases in the drier portions of the Western Slope. Understand that if you're looking at this for Grand Junction, Montrose, Durango, the Western Slope gets a fair amount more moisture than the Eastern Slope. So that wheat belt we talked about a minute ago extends from Iowa through Nebraska and into small portions of Colorado until we get to the high plains. So that wheat belt has grasses predominantly that grow to two to four feet as opposed to the big, uh, the, uh, big blue stem, the Indian grass and the like which can grow five or more feet. And then you Understand that that's 18 to 24 inches of rainfall. There's not a lot of moisture subsurface down below just the top layer. So the roots are shallow and they tend to be more short grass because they don't need as much moisture to be maintained. And over eons, they've adopted 
to that kind of climate. So the Colorado Plains, the next level, is only 10 to 15 inches of rainfall every year. And as a result, um, it's real short grass prairie for the most part. Now, does that mean we can't grow tall grasses or medium grasses from the wheat belt here? Of course not. And they could even grow out on pasture land, especially where it is irrigated. So understanding that if you are doing this for a residential landscape or you're on the board of the HOA and you want to do an entry or you're a commercial person who is charged with uh, landscaping a large commercial project, all kinds of grasses can be grown here, even with this altitude, because most of them will grow in a irrigated setting and with mulches, which are preferable with grasses. You can grow these quite readily um, in a whole wide variety of settings. So the short grasses here, typically on the prairie, are buffalo grass or blue grama. And by the way, blue grama. These are meant more for open areas or large mass plantings of some sort. So they are really not um, something you would use typically for an ornamental individual clump grass. They tend to spread. So understanding where these grasses originated, and you can obviously do research as you're doing here online, listening to this presentation, and um, look up grasses and where they grow. Uh, I have some books here that have been on my shelf for a long time, uh, Taylor's Guide to Ornamental Grasses. And this one is clearly um, a book with great photographs, with a wide variety of descriptions like this, with uh, in-depth information uh, on ornamental grasses. One I like a lot is Marilyn Raff's book on ornamental grasses for Western gardens. And for those that are doing landscape design, whether you are a, a professional designer or are doing your home or you're a landscape contractor, there are great references in here to combinations of plants, those plants that make sense uh, to be planted together. You know, the primary thing when you decide to do a garden follows one of the fundamental Xeriscape philosophies. And when we developed uh, Xeriscape uh, several decades ago, too long ago for me to admit, um, we were approached by the Denver Water Board during a water crisis. And they wanted us to develop some techniques and suggestions or rules to follow, which included putting like water need plants together. So if you plant a yucca, which is very deep rooted, grows out on the dry land prairie where very little rainfall occurs, and then you place it with petunias, you're going to have to overwater the yucca or you underwater the petunia. And that's a silly, dramatic example. But the point is you should try to place. And grasses are that, as I explained a little bit earlier, alluded to, that tall grasses require more water, grasses that habitually are native to the corn belt of the eastern Midwest, get much more rainfall than do those in the western Midwest or the high prairie of Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico. So as a result, that's a very important consideration. But it's also important to understand that grasses will grow in lowland areas near drainages or washes, and they like sandy soil. And that species will not grow up into heavier soils or less moist soils. So you'll find a change of ecosystem as you get out of those sandy soils into heavier soils like the Montmorillonite clays that we have to deal with here. So sandy soil versus clay soil, enhanced soil versus native soil, dig a hole, put the grass in it. So 
The other thing to think about with grasses is they are divided yeah. into two fundamental growing categories. The first is warm season grasses, and they will thrive and produce during those warm times. But clearly, they will quote uh, during the cold weather. Then there are cool season grasses, which actually will bloom a bit earlier in cool weather and go to seed earlier in the year rather than the warm season grasses would seed with the long uh, stems or um, seed heads up high. Some are annual, they won't come back. And some are perennial. Those that are sold by nurseries here are predominantly perennial, but it is a question to ask of that individual helping you wherever you're buying these plants. There are zones, so we've, we've talked about that with many different classes here, that the zones are rated from the highest number being warm to the coldest number being short season, very cold, cooler summers, and very cold in the winter. And we predominantly look at uh, the evaluation with the lowest temperature it can withstand and still survive, if not thrive. So it's important to look, are these zone four or zone three or zone five, or are they zone seven or eight or nine? Because we can grow grasses or any plant, many plants, I should say, not any, that are zone five plants protected in an old town setting where there's mature landscaping, real quality soil, you mulch with organic mulch like bark chips or more preferably gorilla hair mulch. And that is easily uh, attainable in survival with a zone five in most cases. Zone four should survive here without any problem and often at higher elevations uh, up at Estes Park or uh, Red Feather Lakes, uh, which might be a zone three survival as you go up into the foothills and into the base of the mountains. Some of them will go up to 12,000 feet elevations on occasions in certain settings. So it helps to look at that zone the designation and the altitude. So let's start now into natives versus imports. So we've mentioned a few of the names of the natives and you can get little blue stem here in Colorado, uh, which is a marginal, uh, uh, not a marginal, but a not as common grass grown here naturally as it would be in the wheat belt. But in Sterling and other places, you can find Western wheat needlegrass, uh, and the like that are native to the lower wheat belt. But here, uh, in our setting, in a garden, we have a whole lot of hybrids from these grasses. Now, what's the difference between a genus A genus is a large group of plants which have commonality in a great way, but are not necessarily all alike visually. Is, is very specific. In man, it's homo as the genus and sapien as the species. And then we have varietals in a sense with races and ancestries and the evolution of change over eons between the original person or the original plant and those that nature has adjusted to the climate, the altitude, sun intensity, whatever it may be. But man steps in with plants and does a lot of hybridization on his own. And that takes some desirable characteristics 
and decides, I think I can make a cool plant out of that. And as a result, what they do is they try to take cuttings or take seed from that plant, and they will grow those things, even more plants from that long selection that are even more inclined to be different in the way they'd like it to end up. And they continue to do that until they have the same species, the same genus, but a totally different varietal. They register it often with their last name and or a full name, and it becomes a native plant that changes to a nursery plant and nurseries and big box stores and the like will promote them. See Often we uh, less invasive. So all of these go into selecting a varietal. And it's done with roses and iris and shrubs and trees and all kinds of plants, including corns and, and, and food crops. So with grasses, we don't only grow natives here. Over many years, we have imported grasses and we've gotten them from Europe, but more or varietal of plants that uh, have a different look or a different growth pattern. And clearly, as we have used them in horticultural settings or in testing, we eliminate a few of them that just don't work or we try to hybridize so they will. So plants like maiden grass, very commonly grown here, uh, many varietals, several species, um, and that's miscanthus is the name of that genus. And miscanthus grasses, and that, that term miscanthus, the botanic name uh, of the genus, is often used as a common name. Customer will walk into a store and say, I would like some miscanthus. Well, that's great, but there are many varietals in many shades, in many growth styles, in many heights, uh, and it's important to do a little homework. I would best advise you to come into a nursery and walk around, get someone there that can help you. And here at Fossil Creek Nursery, uh, we pride ourselves dramatically uh, well, I believe, uh, on educating our people here who are predominantly educated in horticulture prior to coming here. Uh, and we pride ourselves uh, on sharing the knowledge that we have and spending the time with the client to help them find what they want. So that's a good method to come in and actually see it. You know, the internet's a great thing. I'm a pretty old guy and uh, there were rotary phones and, and uh, operators that you'd have to ask to dial a number for you when I was young. So the internet is, is a revelation, but it can also be misleading. And if you go on the internet and you uh, take as gospel whatever you see, uh, that can be unfortunate at times because a lot of the information is specific to a given area. So we like to broaden that spectrum because here at Fossil Creek, we deal with people who come down from the mountains to purchase plants, people in Laramie and Cheyenne and Casper, Wyoming, well north of our location. Some people come from Thornton, Colorado, uh, northern Denver, or out on the eastern plains. All of those environments are different. They have different and very specific restrictions or challenges in weather or wind or soil types. So it's important before you talk to someone to take some photographs of the location you choose to put things in, whether it's grasses or anything else, and actually check the soils, understand the conditions that you want to plant things in, and you present this 
to the good people you visit in the nursery and uh, get information from. So let's talk about different varietals and different types of plants. So clearly one of the best things that you can do is understand that most grasses, although some will grow in decent shade without direct sunlight, most will not flower. And when I say flower, you think grass is flower. Well, that's the creation of the seed head and the long stalks, which makes grasses often very attractive. And a lot, a lot of times the main reason why they are grown. So one of the things that you have to understand is in order to, to flower for any plant that flowers or most every plant that aren't over eons grown in low light, you must give them about three to five hours of direct sunlight during the course of a day. Some will tolerate shade more than others, but they often don't bloom if they don't get enough sunlight. They turn floppy and weak unlike their varietals should look, although there are some grasses that are extremely weepy and they look like a low fountain and they're gorgeous for that purpose. But a Carl Forrester, one of the most common and popular grasses uh, grown in uh, organic, or pardon me, um, in uh, culture, uh, uh, in a landscape setting, are um, meant to be upright. And they would normally grow three to four to five feet tall when they're healthy, about five feet, maybe even more in the right setting. And being a, a cool season grass uh, that will sway in the wind and stay there all year. They turn a browner color a little earlier in the season. And you would leave them, along with most ornamental grasses, without pruning or cutting back in any way all winter long because the gentle breezes that create the noise that the grass makes in its swaying or the gentle motion is a highly desirable thing in most settings. In a lot of cases, some of the taller grasses are even used for screening. And we do have to cut those old growth uh, leaves and seed heads down, but we leave them all winter. The best time to do it, the end of February, beginning of March. And you, if you keep up your antenna and pay attention, you want to avoid waiting until the ground and starts to grow up in among the brown. And then you try to cut the brown, you cut off all the new leaves. That's not a good idea. So it's generally easily done with hedge clippers, the big guys that you have the long blades, not the little long edge that are loppers that cut big branches. And you can cut these seed heads. You could do it with a hand pruner as well, but it would just take you a fair amount longer. I would recommend that you keep it about six inches above the ground. You don't want to cut it too deep, but about six inches, you remove them in the beginning of March, and as the new grasses grow, uh, they won't be inhibited in appeal, visual appeal, or in their growth by the old uh, stems and seed heads. So let's talk about varietals of grasses and how they grow. So we can do that quite easily. I'll go down a list here that I've created that might be of some help. Um, as long as you determine the moisture area and whether you have supplemental irrigation or whether you're an avid gardener and you're out there all the time hand watering, once plants are transplanted, they always need help. No matter what the plant is, it just doesn't automatically grow and they need to be established. So when we transplant any plant, everything, everything is about the root structure and root development because anything above ground is the size of the family you have to support. The job to create the income and the bank account to store leftover income after spending it on the family is the root structure. 
The job is the hair roots and the feeder roots that absorb moisture and absorb essential nutrients, especially amino acids, and blend it with sunlight and carbon dioxide from the air, and they make sugar, carbohydrates, which they eat. This is all plants do this. So encouraging their growth in the root structure and not worrying about top growth is very, very important. So we then, in order to do that, would feed with NPK. The P is phosphorus, and its main job is to produce roots, and its secondary job is to produce blooms. What are blooms on grasses? They're the seed heads on the stems. And they are flowers, and they contain seed, like any flower would. And as a result, you will get an attractive plant, both in health and growth potential and survivability, as well as flowering and seed heads if you feed a higher phosphorus fertilizer in the springtime or when first transplanted. And then again in the fall. So let's get into those uh, varietals that make a good deal of sense. Um, for the tall grasses, we talked about Carl Forrester, and that is a Callum fancy botanic language, but it's called a feather reed grass. And it's popular for a few reasons. Number one, it's hardy as heck here. Number two, its feather seed heads are abundant and very tall. They're very um, firm and hardy. Uh, they're strong, so they don't break easily. They happen early in the year, so they're attractive all year, and they stay in their shape. Now, all plants will grow in size to some degree, as all of us will. Uh, any any living thing will grow in size. Some grasses, however, spread to a good degree. And many types of plants are included in, when you talk about grasses, in the grouping that you would, the greater grouping you would discuss with grasses. And one of those is sedges. Uh, which are mostly tubular. You don't see the leaf spread like you would on grasses. And they grow in, in more um, moist settings, in marshes and uh, sometimes in the water. And things like umbrella or uh, papyrus or plants like that. We're not including any of that here. Although if you have a water feature, they would be rather ideal to grow within that setting, actually in a pot in the water like you would but one other that is a graminoid and there are many or two that grow here hardly called a hardy bamboo but these are invasive plants like mint would be or like bindweed, which you don't want in your garden. It comes up everywhere and you can pull it and spray it and it comes up again. So if you're going to plant bamboo and, and plant it as an ornamental, you must select the right variety and contain it. But today let's stick with true graminoids. And that is the tall, the medium height, and the short ornamental grasses. So. One of the things that's critical is to understand height potential and the normal way it would be used in a design or in an attractive setting. Now you can combine these clump grasses like blue fescue or um, side oats grama or uh, sea oats that are very attractive in a perennial garden and they would do very well. And they grow sh short or medium height. And if you put them as a foreground plant, like you would blue fescue, Festuca glauca, or you would put them in a more medium setting, like you would maybe uh, sea oats, uh, and you then have foreground in front of the sea oats, they work. Forester, 
feathered grass or a miscanthus, miscanthus, and probably need a sip here. And they will use them as a focal point, as something that uh, is a key feature that catches the eye, and they're planted as a shrub in a separate setting, giving them enough room to grow both vertically and horizontally. Grasses generally have to have aggressive root structure, and they can and should be encouraged to have deep root structure so that they can stay drought tolerant. So let's talk about the grasses that work on the as, as tall, tall grasses. You can get big blue stem that grows five feet, even six feet as they mature in certain settings. And you can get it as a focal point like Carl Forster. Uh, and yet you don't want too many of those. People come in to the nursery. I used to own a very large nursery and garden center and greenhouse in Denver many years ago. And um, they would come in and ask, I want a grass or I want pompous grass because that's the only name they knew. Well, most people don't want pompous grass because it can grow to 10 or 12 feet tall with the seed heads and is overwhelming in a garden. Now in certain settings or in a corner planting in a yard, uh, it might be desirable. But in most cases, there are far more interesting plants and um, non-overwhelming kinds of grasses that we can plant. So height potential is very important to understand along with soil type and moisture and whether they are uh, invasive or not. So let's go back to that invasive part. How do plants spread and reproduce? There are three ways that grasses do that. Number one, obviously, by the seed heads. And we see those all the time. Even if you let your, uh, your turf grass grow with the rise and the fescue and especially bluegrass. Popping up like mad. So all of them produce seed. But many, like rye and fescue and bluegrass and certain other varietals of native grasses, spread underground or above ground by a shoot. So let me explain that briefly because there are other plants in nature that do this very thing because eons of evolution have taught them they have to survive. And there are different developed ways to do that. So when a plant has a rhizome, it grows underground on the root and a new shoot comes up from a side root and it starts to spread in the ground by extending those roots and bringing up a baby plant. And there are other plants in nature that do that, in the garden that do that. And they are things like raspberry or some ground covers or aspen, apple and plum, other, any of the prunus, the pitted fruit varieties. They have suckers, the Canadian or Canada red cherry, suckers all over the place. Great deep shade tree, fast growing, hardy as heck, weak. But it puts up suckers all over and it can drive people crazy if they're not aware and they don't plan for that. So you have to be very careful of rhizomes because they're hidden underground and whoop, up it comes. The other way is by a stolen. It's kind of a, a fishing rod that may go out next to the plant and it has a, a new young plant on it and as the weight of that plant brings it down it touches the ground and it spreads roots and strawberries do that or a spider plant can do that uh, does that as a, a matter of reproduction so grasses do those things and you have to be aware of what you're selecting, you're going to have a mess on your hands. So ask that question. Do your homework. Be sure it's a clump grass if that's what you want. If you want it to spread in an area, you have to get rhizominous or stoliniferous plants. So back to those, that list of larger plants and those we can grow that get a little bit bigger. Um, a lot of 
the varietals that we look at, like Indian grass that grows in the Corn Belt. Um, this is tall grass prairie stuff. Colors vary, but they can turn yellow and then orange in the fall where they're gorgeous. And part of the beauty of, of uh, ornamental grasses is that there's such variety in the width of their leaves or the, the variegation of leaves or the narrow growing color of leaves, Japanese bloodgrass, uh, or some of the miscanthus varieties that are spotted and variegated. Uh, others that turn dramatic colors either in summer or later in the fall. And one of those certainly is the Indian grass. It's a lovely tall grass, very hardy. I think it's very underused. And it's one of my absolute favorites. It has this blue gray foliage uh, that grows uh, in, in the standard growing season. Uh, but you can see heads on the stems and the early bloom and the fall color of some of the varietals is striking. They're hardy as heck and they are shade tolerant, but it prefers moisture soil. So if you have supplemental irrigation, either by uh, a, an overspray from a sprinkler system that gets it decent water or better, an emitter system in a drip, uh, that would be more desirable. Uh, another one that I like, along with the Carl Forrester, is um, being able to get the tall size of a flame grass. This is a miscanthus, and again, this is imported from Asia, and miscanthus is probably the biggest genus of ornamental plants in warmer climates. Uh, it can get to five feet tall, very attractive, uh, beautiful open pale pink uh, blossoms. They turn a silvery color, they're very attractive, and again, a hardy grass. Um, into the moderate ones. This is the one where it, the moderate and the, and the shorter ones are the ones where we have a whole lot more option in uh, our, our selection potential. The colors of their standard growth, not their mature dry growth, fall growth, uh, or dormant growth, are delightful and often change again into a very attractive uh, dormant growth or um, a uh, off-season growth. So things like tufted hair grass, northern lights is a great varietal. This one will grow to 12,000 feet. So if you're a mountain person, it grows to three to four feet. Now some might not call that a tall grass, but at that altitude, without a tap, that's a very tall grass. So altitude and, and climate and water will have a direct uh, impact, of course, and this is an important thing to mention, on uh, the, the growth potential of the plant. If it's under stress all the time, or the growing season is shorter, or uh, the temperature isn't quite as warm, you're going to find that you're not going to reach those high potentials of uh, height as you would in a more ideal uh, setting for sure. Um, there are things like Miscanthus gigantus or giganteus that, um, heck, that grows to eight feet. That's like a pompous grass. And they're not as commonly grown. The zone four, warm season grass. So um, let's talk about some of the shorter ones, though. The flame grass I like very much with that orange red fall color, but it's not always um, as consistent, even though um, clearly it is a, a, a um, commonly grown grass. Here. So some of the ones that I happen to like that are shorter are fountain, standard fountain grass. Carl Forrester being one of those, but Little Bunny can grow to a foot and a half, uh, very attractive. Uh, Hamlin is a two-footer, is a compact one. So 
even though you might see Carl Forster at four or five feet, there are others within the genus. So it's like asking how tall is a person? Well, we're all the same genus and species, but are we talking about an NBA center at seven foot one, or are we talking about a guard at five foot 11? Uh, we're all different in some ways. So it is important to understand that as well and to plan within the, the possible realm of growth potential and then try to meet its normal and standard needs as much as you can. One thing we want to avoid, unless you're aware of it, you put it in a container or you are clear putting it in an annual bed and you're going to lose it are uh, some of the plants that are zone seven, eight, nine, ten, that will grow here, but you will lemongrass or uh, some of the penicetums like rubrum or um, maybe purple majesty or a plant like that. Uh, so ask that question for sure and some of the box stores, although you can get good deals, um, the people are not as knowledgeable about one or the other. And often they import annual grasses, put them in with the perennials inadvertently, no blame here. But uh, it's more of an ignorance, uh, and that's not a pejorative, but a, an And it doesn't. So it's a fundamental question to at least ask or to research. So back in the day when I started here in the industry, uh, blue fescue was one of the key focus plants that stay small, relatively speaking. And you put it in the ground and the, it's a one gallon container and the grass isn't much bigger than the pot. And it's very thin blue leaves, very attractive, very short flower heads. And they make a good running border or uh, occasional accent plant in the foreground of a bed. But there are others now that have been developed that like moderately moist soils, but that are shorter, that are even uh, six inches tall or barely a foot, not a foot and a half or more. And um, then there are others that with the right setting, it may say a foot and a half, but something like Korean feather reed grass is going to grow to three feet, even in the partial shade. So let's talk about um, the mulch part of this. So whatever you choose, whether it's a tall grass as a focal point plant or a grouping or background that's behind a group of perennials or annuals, or whether it is a grass setting where you mix a few different grasses that don't spread by the roots or by stores. create a grass garden, which can be exceedingly attractive. You need to put those, remember the moisture content, the soil needs, and the light needs, and put those together. So something like side oats grama, which is native prairie grass here and into the wheat belt, grows maybe a foot, maybe two and a half feet, and you might consider it a low grass at a foot, but in the right setting, it'll grow even taller. So you've got to be very careful or you may want to divide. So let's talk about years down the road. Certain plants, certain grasses are relative, relatively easy to divide and your division five years, depending on how heartily they're growing. And you can, if you're a gardener, dig them up, divide them up, give one away, put the other one back, or move one into another part of the garden. Others, however, have a root structure that I would challenge anyone to divide. Even difficult division might be almost impossible. So that's a consideration as well. And that's a little more hard to determine. But understand that you don't just plunk it in the ground and leave it forever because all things mature and all things need uh, space to grow. 
So here's the summation of all of this. Don't use turf grasses where turf grasses don't belong. Don't use pasture grasses. To go to a place that has ornamental grass seed or specific seed. If you have friends that are growing a great grass that you like that is ornamental or a clump, collect seed from that if you are inclined to grow things from seed. But that takes quite a while. If you come into a nursery, you can get many of these in a one gallon container and others in twos or five gallon containers. The five gallon obviously are more mature and bigger and taller, but the same grass. And I know we carry tons of Carl Forrester because people come in like with pompous grass and they say, I want some Carl Forrester. Now, they may mean they want feathery Carl Forrester, but they want a tall, attractive clump grass like that. So do a little bit of homework. We're good at this here. Feel free to call and ask questions. Uh, my name is Doc, but Jackson or Dan or Elka or any of us here are delighted to help you and give you information either on the phone or better yet to come in and see what we're talking about. I want to thank you for being here today and I want to remind you we do classes on a regular basis. Here. Some of them are in-person classes and some are like this live on Instagram, Facebook and the like. Uh, I uh, during my many decades in the business had the privilege to work creating bonsai gardens and being trained by uh, Japanese gardeners in bonsai. So I'll be teaching a class on the 13th and we have samples of a wide variety of very cool plants and pots here that uh, I have done some training on and that are quite attractive. That and all the other classes we do, uh, these are a whole lot of fun, uh, and we have energy and knowledge to share, and we're always delighted to do that. So please come visit us, call us. Happy gardening. You take care.